This is One to One. I'm Tom Zirkel, and it's a pleasure to welcome you once again to our time together. Today we are talking about the Christian's way to eternity. We find Christ giving the Sermon on the Mount. And at the very beginning of this sermon, he pronounces a series of blessings. Blessings on the Christian as he finds his way toward eternity. In the first beatitude, the blessing is on the poor in spirit. Christ says the kingdom of heaven is theirs. The sinner recognizes his need and comes to God. In the second beatitude, Christ talks about blessing those who mourn, for they will be comforted. People who have sorrow for their sins, sorrow for the pain that they have caused Christ. And then the third, the blessing on the meek, where Christ says that they will inherit the earth. The meek person whose instincts are under control, who has experienced the results of conversion. And then the fourth beatitude, the person hungering and thirsting for righteousness, for a closer walk with the Master, for growth in Christ, thirsting for Christ's covering of their sins, and the continued search for more truth, indeed for all truth, and to them their promise will be fulfilled. And then the merciful. The merciful are blessed because they will obtain mercy. The merciful is the person with the pitying heart, the person with true empathy for the down and out who need their care, entering into the misery of those who need and the desire to help. And these obtain mercy promised by God. Today we take up the story with Christ still speaking and in Matthew 5 verse 8 we read the following, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Now the people that Jesus was talking to understood about purity, they depended on outward purity, washings and cleansings, and they thought that this would give them eternal life. Jesus, however, looked on inward cleansing, the cleansing of the heart and the cleansing of the life. The importance of the blood of the covenant that must cleanse because without it, no one will see God. God is pure and we must also be pure if we would ever hope to see him. Here we will look for a moment at the word to see. As it's used here, it means to possess to have the presence of God. The pagan religions, many of the prophets of the pagan religions uh, boasted that their sages could see their deities from time to time. But the Christian actually enjoys the nearness to God through the Holy Spirit. The legally pure Israelite could enter the temple and there find rest. But the Christian, the pure in heart, enter through Christ into the throne room of the universe. This word pure in Greek, katharos, has several meanings. It may mean to have clean clothing. It may mean to have clean corn that does not have any chaff in it. It can also mean the cleanliness of a first-class army that doesn't have any discontented or cowards in it. It also may be milk that's been unadulterated with water or metal that contains no alloy. And so being pure speaks to our motives. So often our, our motives are mixed. We give generously, but and it's for the good of others but our pride is often involved. Our self-approval, our acceptance of praise and thanks and credit, all of these things mar the purity of our giving. We may be heroes, even martyrs, but the purity may not be there. Story is told of John Bunyan, who uh, when he had preached well, was told this by one of his parishioners. And this is his answer. The devil already told me that as I was coming down the steps from the pulpit. And so 
This beatitude requires self-examination. We need to look for ourself in the things that we do and get it out of us. Our giving, our worship, our prayer, our social activities, our relationships with the Lord all need to be looked at to be sure that these things are based on our need for God and not on self. It's a truism of life that we see only what we can see. On a starry night, the ordinary person looks up at the sky and sees many little white dots. The astronomer, though, sees individual stars, planets, constellations, and the navigator of the ship sees specific stars that will guide his ship across the boundless ocean. The ordinary person on a country road may see a lot of weeds, but the botanist sees individual identified species of plants. And so in, in every sphere of life, we tend to see what we've been trained to see. And so Jesus says, if you would see God, your heart must be pure. God's grace cleanses our hearts and our human lust soils them. Day by day, we are either preparing or not preparing to see God. This yearning to see God appears many times in Scripture. We will look at a few of these. The first, actually, is a reverse of wanting to see God. In Genesis 3.10, we read the following, And he, this is Adam, said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. The story is that Adam had disobeyed God, and he had joined Eve in partaking of the forbidden fruit. His eyes were opened by sin, and so he and Eve hid themselves. A perfect example of the result of an impure heart. A little later, Israel is on the way to Canaan. They're in the wilderness. Moses is on the mountain with God, and uh, Aaron and the people were in the plain, and they made themselves a god to worship. Moses returned from the mountain and rallied the Levites who killed 3,000 of the idolaters. The Lord struck the people with a plague and the people mourned. Moses moved the tabernacle out of the camp. And the question was, would the group go on? Would they make it to the promised land? And Moses needed reassurance too. And so he spoke to God in Genesis 33, in Exodus 33, 13. If you are pleased with me, teach me your ways so that I may know you and continue to find favor with you. And the Lord immediately answered in the next verse, Exodus 33, 14. The Lord replied, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. And so the conversation between Moses and God continued. And uh, God told Moses that he would call him by name. And then in verse 18, the request is made. In Exodus 33:18, Moses said, Now show me your glory. And the Lord immediately answered in Exodus 33:19 and 20. Then the Lord said, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you. But, he said, you cannot see my face, for no one may see me and live. And so the longing to see the face of God had persisted down through ages. Christ came to the earth. He grew up. He ministered. And his time on earth was nearly over. And he was explaining to his disciples the approach to the Father. In John 14, 6, Jesus answered, I am the way the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. But Philip, one of the disciples, could still not grasp this truth. And in John 14, 8, he's, we read this. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. He couldn't see beyond the seen to the unseen. It was too much for him to grasp. And Jesus immediately answered in John 14, verse 9, Don't you know me, Philip, 
even after I've been among you such a long time. Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? And when he said this, Jesus was emphasizing something that he'd already told the disciples earlier in John 10, verse 30. He said, I and the Father are one. And so we can well remember this as we open the Gospels to read them, that what Jesus said is really God speaking as well. And the way Jesus acted is the way God the Father would act as well. And then finally, in Revelation, the beloved Apostle John was in vision. And just as in the beginning, Adam feared to see God's face, so at the end, there will be those who have not purified their hearts who will react the same way. In Revelation 6, 15 and 16, then the kings of the earth and the princes, the generals, the rich and the mighty and every slave and every free man hid in caves among the rocks of the mountains. And they called on the mountains and the rocks, fall on us, hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. But the words of Christ also to the pure in heart are fulfilled then as well. In Revelation 22, verses 3 and 4, No longer will there be any curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and His servants will serve Him. And they will see His face, and His name will be in their foreheads. So now we see the promise that had been made by Christ to the pure in heart is completely fulfilled. The promise that the Beatitudes make to the poor in spirit also fulfilled, for this is the kingdom of heaven. All the other promises of God down through the ages fulfilled as well. Another time we might look at some of the other Beatitudes where the promise of the persecuted is the kingdom of heaven and the place of great rewards for the faithful is there as well. And yes, this is the kingdom that will be the home of the children of God. In Revelation 22:14, we read the following, Blessed are they that do His commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life, and may enter in through the gates into the city. And so this is the reward of the Christian, the Christian's way to eternity, given at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount by Jesus, as he spoke to the people explaining his mission, why he had come, and what they might expect to receive for the kingdom of God. This also may be our reward as well. This is the Loma Linda Broadcasting Network.